All right. So why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to let Dr. Tomei introduce our uh, speaker today. I just wanted to um, talk briefly about uh, the uh, event. So we're here to um, have the uh, third annual uh, Don Morton Visiting Professor Lectureship. Uh, Dr. Morton um, actually uh, doesn't have any specific ties to WVU. He was, uh, however, a native of uh, West Virginia. He grew up in the uh, southern part of the state in the coal, in, in the coal fields. Uh, he's one of the most uh, prominent uh, surgical oncologists in the last uh, probably 40 or 50 years. Um, he's uh, most well known for establishing the John Wayne Cancer Center uh, in 1991. Uh, he was uh, a president of the Society of Surgical Oncology, which is the major uh, academic uh, surgical society for, uh, for uh, oncologic surgeons. Uh, he won uh, numerous awards, including the uh, Jacobson Award for Innovation. Uh, he was uh, continuously NIH funded for over 35 years. He, offered over, he authored over 1,000 uh, papers. His primary uh, uh, interests and in, uh, what he's best known for is uh, the uh, uh, management of uh, melanoma. Uh, and we've esta we established this lecture a couple of years ago under uh, Dr. Nakayama, and we've been fortunate to have um, leaders in the field uh, for the first uh, two years. Uh, in 2015, we had Armando Giuliani, Giuliano uh, from Cedar sinai He was uh, partners with Dr. Morton at, uh, at John Wayne, and um, he talked about uh, the rise and fall of lymphadenectomy for breast uh, cancer. Last year, we were lucky to have Dr. Doug Evans, who's uh, one of the uh, world's leaders in pancreatic cancer. He talked about challenges in pancreatic uh, cancer, uh, and this year, we're uh, honored to have uh, Dr. Jeffrey Pharma, who's coming from Fox Chase in Philadelphia. He was uh, a mentor to Dr. Tomei, so I'm going to turn the uh, podium over to Dr. Tomei to introduce Dr. Pharma. Uh, so it really is an honor uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Jeffrey Pharma, um, and thank you to everybody for coming and Dr. Pharma for traveling out here. Uh, Dr. Pharma got his uh, Bachelor's of Arts, I believe, at Tufts. Um, he then went on to Temple University where he got his MD degree um, and he did his residency at Temple. Uh, while he was there, he took two years to do a surgical oncology research fellow at the National Cancer Institute um, in DC. Um, after that, he went on to fellowship at uh, Moffitt uh, down in Tampa uh, where he did a lot of uh, just about everything, uh, but especially a lot of melanoma of which he's going to talk to us about today. Um, he is now currently the Associate Professor of Surgery at Fox Chase Cancer Center. He's also the Program Director of the Fellowship there for any of our residents who are interested in going into fellowship. Um, he's a member of a number of societies, including the American College, the SSO, uh, but also the Society of University Surgeons. Uh, that he started in 2014. Uh, if you look at his uh, CV, uh, when, I, when I looked at it, I even kind of knew it was coming. Uh, 33 peer-reviewed journal articles, nine book chapters, and over 75 posters or plenary sessions that he's been responsible for. Uh, he's been invited to speak uh, almost 50 times now at a number of conferences such as this um, and others. Uh, the awards he's won include um, a traveling um, visiting professorship to Germany uh, through the American College of Surgeons. Uh, for some of the young surgeons in the room, it's a pretty prestigious honor. Um, they have them uh, somewhere between two or three times a year. Uh, to different countries to go and kind of experience um, how it's done in, in those particular countries. And so I think you got to take your wife for two weeks to Germany, which is always kind of nice. Um, in uh, 2014, he was also inducted as an honorary member into AOA. And uh, just last year, he won the Humanitarian Award for the Melanoma Research Foundation um, in Philadelphia, which is also a big honor. He lives with his wonderful wife, Daria, and his three children um, in, uh, well, just outside of Philadelphia. Um, <coughs> And uh, just like me, is a big Star Wars fan. So um, we appreciate you being here. And uh, please welcome Dr. Farmer to the podium. Well, thank you for the invitation to talk. It really is a great honor to be the Don Morton uh, uh, lecturer. Um, and I'll speak a little bit about him. I've had the privilege of uh, interacting with him through some uh, cooperative uh, international clinical trials. So today I'm going to talk about the evolution and the surgical management of melanoma. Uh, melanoma is a rare disease, although it is one of the cancers that has the increased incidence. And uh, at Fox Chase, I see a lot of melanoma. It's probably about 60% of my practice. 
We have a multidisciplinary team, clinic, tumor board, all related to melanoma. I have no disclosures. So today I'm going to talk about the diagnosis and just an overview about of how, just how you deal with patients with pigmented lesions. I'll briefly touch on genetic screening and, and why you should consider this in, some, in a subset of patients with melanoma. We'll talk about the surgical treatment of melanoma. Um, briefly talk about surveillance, so how do you follow these patients and who do you consider referring to medical oncology for adjuvant therapy. Uh, treatment of in-transit melanoma, so uh, nodules that occur on the extremity, um, which we see um, more frequently. And then an update briefly on systemic therapy, basically systemic therapy for surgeons and what you need to know. And I have a couple of cases, and I know we'll do some cases afterwards. So melanoma is a malignancy of the melanocytes. You all know this. So it's about 5% of cutaneous malignancies. Um, despite being the minority of cutaneous malignancies, it really is the number one uh, cause of death or skin cancer-related deaths um, due to its high risk of metastasis. Uh, this is the most um, recent update on um, the incidence. So you can see that melanoma is the fifth most common cancer in men, sixth most common in women. Um, and these, and its incidence has tripled in the last 20 years, mostly from uh, sun tanning. Uh, there's a 3% increase in year, and this, again, this is one of the cancers that still is increasing um, and hasn't stabilized. Um, this was, uh, I pulled it, uh, this was the most recent SEER data. So the estimated new cases in the countries were, were 87,000 cases of new melanoma, 5.2% of all cancer cases, uh, leading to almost 10,000 deaths per year. And this is a really, I pulled this uh, actually, so this was the incidence of melanoma in West Virginia. So you can go on SEER and you can map out both the incidence and mortality of all different types of cancer per state and then they break it down per county. And so you can kind of see the distribution and incidence of West Virginia uh, in, of melanoma in your state. So this is one of the most uh, important reasons. So tanning is ingrained in our culture. Um, it is considered to be beautiful, make you feel better, increase your vitamin D levels. Um, and 20, 15, 10 years ago, um, there wasn't really much emphasis on the risks of tanning. Um, sunscreen has become more prevalent, thankful, uh, but this is the main problem, and it's still a problem. And as you can see here, this is just the incidence of melanoma over time, um, where one in 50 uh, um, people will get uh, skin cancer. It leads to the second most common uh, cancer cause of potential life loss, in addition, it really, we see an increased risk in a younger demographic, so young, especially young women who are using tanning salons for spring break, for prom. Um, we're seeing a much higher rate of melanoma in younger patients, where I see 18-year-olds, 20-year-olds who are coming in with melanoma. Um, and there's also things, there is tanning addictions. So there's uh, patients who come in and who are addicted to tanning who have a much higher risk of skin cancer. And so the risk of dying from melanoma is in about 1 in 555 men and 1 in 476 women. And again, the most common cause is uh, ultraviolet exposure. Uh, brief, intermittent, severe exposures are worse than continuous. And if you have five or more sunburns, you have a two-fold incidence of melanoma. Tanning beds also have the same ultraviolet exposure. Um, so related to tanning beds, so this is a billion-dollar industry in the U.S., there's legislation throughout the world to limit tanning, um, but you, um, there's legislation in the United States to limit tanning in younger patients where they need to have uh, at least parental consent to undergo tanning. Um, but there have been studies that show that tan if you tan and the increased number of tanning, t of times going to a tanning salon will increase your risk of all the different types of skin cancer, basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma. One of our researchers at Fox Chase is actually an international uh, expert on, um, um, on tanning in young patients, and they've actually created this whole website with avatars and kind of imagery to see how you would look after tanning as you age um, to try to intervene in a younger uh, demographic of patients. And here you can just see skin cancer risk and related to tanning beds uh, with an increased risk of all three uh, types of skin cancers. 
So this I thought was a, a very funny ad I saw at a meeting. This is an Australian ad. I think they're a lot more progressive in their advertising. Uh, and it says, protect your lar largest organ, and your skin is your largest organ. So, um. And so I, I put in a couple of uh, funny. Uh, so this is Dr. Tomei trying, uh, with his new headlight for the OR. Um, it didn't get past our OR nurses when he first showed up at Fox Chase, but he tried. So who gets it? So um, patients with multiple nevi on their skin, um, if you have 50, you're about a five-fold increased risk of having melanoma. If you have 100 nevi, you're about a 17-fold increased risk. If you have atypical nevi, so if you have multiple dysplastic nevi and go to the dermatologist and have biopsies, you, um, if you have over 10 atypical nevi with, throughout life, you're at a 20-fold increase of having melanoma. And there are some factors that are known to be familial. So the minority of patients with melanoma will have a genetic risk for this. However, if you have a family history of multiple patients with melanoma in your family, uh, skin type and color, fair skin, redhead, um, you're at increased risk. <laughs> Uh, environmental, so if you've had three blistering sunburns before the age of 20, increased risk. If you've had outdoor summer jobs for greater than three years in your adolescence, if you've used sun lamps and tanning salons, you're at an increased risk. If you have had multiple actinic keratoses, marked freckling on the upper back, large number of normal nevi, all these things can put you at increased risk. So only about 5 to 10 percent of patients are at a risk of melanoma. Obviously, most of, a lot of my patients come in and are concerned about their family and risk. And the minority of patients, most of these are related to sun exposure. But there are some mutations we can test for. So there's a CDKN2A mutation. Uh, this occurs in about 1 percent of patients um, would have this with melanoma. And you would see two uh, greater than three affected family members that would have melanoma. I ask every patient I see about pancreatic cancer because if they have a family history of pancreatic cancer, that can be a suspicion that they may have this mutation. Um, and then there's, uh, if you have multiple primary melanomas, uh, personally or in your family, you also could have this mutation. We can check, so if a patient comes in and has some of these higher risk features, I will send them to genetic testing. It's a, somewhat limited as what we do with that information. So if we actually identify a mutation, we're already, they're already seeing their dermatologist two to three times a year for skin surveillance. But we can screen them for some of these other cancers that we know are associated with it. So um, most of you know this, the ABCDEs of melanoma, asymmetry, borders, color, diameter, evolution. Um, and they really can um, present in any uh, fashion. Um, patients frequently or their or their uh, wives or spouses are frequently um, the ones who identify a changing mole. But they also can present like this. So this is a, a woman who had a large nodular melanoma on her arm. This was an interesting lesion that was mostly melanoma in situ. Um, the lesion actually had regressed. So the central portion here had actually become non-pigmented. But this area here became blacker and turned into a melanoma. This is an amelanotic melanoma in the mid-back. And one woman walked into my clinic with this. This is a large fungating melanoma on her back. Obviously, she had some other um, psychiatric issues and hadn't really, she was married and her husband had not seen it. Um, but um, we see all different uh, shapes and sizes of melanoma. So this is always contentious for surgeons and if you read any of the textbooks. Um, there's multiple ways to biopsy melanoma or pigmented lesions, and for your ab site or boards, um, you can do a shave biopsy. Um, the surgical literature would say you should not do a shave biopsy because you're not really looking at the full depth. That being said, 95% of my patients who come in come from dermatologists and have had a shave biopsy. I don't re-biopsy them usually. We review all the slides. Um, the key is just really to seeing if, if I will re-biopsy it if I think it will change my management. Um, but the dermatology literature and how they see patients, the majority of what they're seeing is not melanoma. They have high volume clinics. A shave biopsy is a much quicker procedure to do in their clinics, and that's why they come to you. Most of what they see they don't think is melanoma. If they really think it's melanoma, then they should probably either do a punch biopsy or a narrow uh, excisional biopsy uh, to not disrupt the lymphatics. So doing a shave biopsy theoretically is not the best option, but in reality is what we see. So when you have the biopsy, um, there's multiple factors that you look at, and the most important one besides Breslow depth, so they have a ruler under the microscope to measure how deep the lesion is, is ulceration. 
And this really changes the prognosis. It changes the staging system. So it changes from an A to a B classification in all uh, tumor thickness stages. Um, and it really is a very significant prognostic variable. If you have an ulcerated lesion in an early melanoma, stage one or two, your survival rate is 50% if the tumor is ulcerated versus 78% for all comers if it's not ulcerated. These are real numbers. And so even if you have a thin melanoma that's ulcerated, I still am very concerned about these lesions. Mitotic rate came into uh, about uh, the last 10 years became a factor that we look at. Um, and they break it down to greater than one or less than one uh, in the staging system. And it was thought to be a, a, a higher risk feature. And really that has borne out to be more of a moderate risk factor. Um, it did upstage the thin lesions from a T1A to T1B in the ADACC 7th edition. Um, but this new edition actually is going to take that out because it hasn't really shown to increase the prognosis that much. So everyone, uh, all the residents and students should commit this to memory. So this is from the NCCN guidelines. If you don't know what the NCCN guidelines are, these are st uh, standardized guidelines for every type of cancer. Fox Chase was one of the founding members of the NCCN. Uh, they have a very nice app, and it teaches you about every type of cancer, how to work them up, how to stage them, how to treat them, survey them. Um, and this is in the guidelines just on the excisional margins for melanoma. So if you have a melanoma in situ, you need to resect with 0.5 to 1 centimeter margins. If, you have a, if it's less than 1 millimeter, 1 centimeter. If it's 1 to 2, 1 to 2 centimeters, you have the option. And if it's greater than two, you resect with two centimeters. I never take more than two centimeters. I can't remember the last time we had a positive margin when we've uh, done appropriate excisions. Um, and this is all based on level one data. There was randomized, controlled, uh, phase three trials looking at these different margins. Um, and this is how we came up with these uh, guidelines. So in the operating room, we literally measure with a ruler. So if this is the lesion, I measure the width of the lesion and then we measure the margins with a ruler. So this is two centimeters. We excise it and we orient the specimen for the pathologist. So if a margin was positive, we would know which margin it is. And then this is the defect. And generally, we're able to close it. Uh, same here on the back. Now, sometimes you can't primarily close it. And if we can't primarily close, then sometimes we have to do local advancement flaps, rotational flaps, uh, skin grafts. Um, the, uh, and frequently, I'll get, I, I have the luxury of having plastic surgeons that can, are available pretty much all the time for me. And so if we need to do any kind of complex reconstruction, um, they're helpful with that. But especially on the extremities, um, on uh, pre-tibial region, we frequently have to do skin grafts to close even one centimeter uh, margin sometimes. Um, just related to this, so most surgery um, is really not applicable, applicable for melanoma. There are some advanced Mohs surgeons that are doing it for melanoma in situ on the face. Um, where they have some stains um, where in real time they can check the margins. Um, I, I do see dermatologists that are doing it for Mohs surgery. There was one paper that kind of in the dermatology litter, which I don't believe that they used as support of this, but I don't think it's adequate. Um, the idea is that you would have narrow margins, but I don't, it is not an acceptable modality for melanoma resections. So moving on to regional lymph nodes. So metastasis to lymph nodes can occur. If you, the lesion is less than 0.75 millimeters, the chance of lymph node metastasis is 1%. But the incidence increases, and there's nomograms you can go on. There's something called life math or the memorial nomogram to actually I, uh, to give accurate percentages to patients when you're seeing them based on the primary tumor. So if a lesion's one to two millimeters, there's about a 15% chance of having lymph node metastasis. And as they become thicker, the, the chances go up 30, 40%. And lymph nodes still remain one of the most important prognostic variables for melanoma, and I'll talk about that. So this is a picture of Don Morton. So he is really probably one of the most famous preeminent surgical oncologists and surgeons in the country. He has run more clinical trials than most surgeons uh, throughout the world. Um, he was the innovator uh, and really helped develop sentinel lymph node biopsy for breast cancer and for melanoma. And when this first started, everyone thought he was a little crazy and really questioned if this was an accurate modality to evaluate lymph nodes. And with time, this has become the standard of care 
for melanoma, for breast cancer, we do it for Merkel cell, we do it for some squamous cell. And he really was a true surgical innovator that changed the field, not only for surgeons, but I think for medical oncologists and, uh, and throughout the world. Um, my consideration for sentinel node biopsy now, so if uh, I will consider it for a lesion that's greater than 0.76 millimeters. Um, if the Clark stage, although this Clark's, um, Clark was at Temple actually where I trained and it's based on the layers of the skin. If it's a Clark's level four, I will consider it, but it's really come, gone to the wayside in terms of it's sometimes not even reported in forms anymore, in uh, the pathology forms anymore. If it's a high mitotic rate, so not just one, but sometimes we see five, 10, 20, I will consider a sentinel node biopsy. If the margin was deep, so if you have a thinner melanoma, but the deep, it was a shave biopsy and the deep margin was positive, so let's say it was 0.6 and deep margin's positive, I will have a discussion with them because potentially it could be thicker. If it's ulcerated, I surely will consider it based on any thickness. So even a thin melanoma, we had one woman who was young, 0.5 millimeter melanoma, for mitosis and ulcerated who had a positive sentinel node. So I will consider in that. It is, if there's no palpable adenopathy, so if a patient comes in and you feel lymph nodes, you should not be doing a sentinel node biopsy. You should be evaluating them because you already know, you've answered the question, you should do an ultrasound guided needle biopsy of the lymph node. And if that's positive, then consider a lymphadenectomy. Um, and the staging system really, so there's no micrometastasis for melanoma, it, like in breast cancer. If you have a, cells in the lymph node, that's considered stage three. That may change with, t change with time. And so again, going back to the NCCN guidelines, um, so it, you discuss and offer sentinel node for 0.76 to one millimeters. And then there's this box here, which is a, it, it really just a gray box that basically says we don't know exactly what's best to do. And the box says that you can consider sentinel node uh, from 0.76 to one in the appropriate clinical context, which includes high risk features like uh, ulceration, high mitotic rate, lymphovascular invasion, or very uncommon melanomas like nodular melanomas. But the chance of having a positive sentinel node with a thin melanoma less than 0.75 is fairly low. So the patients come in the morning of surgery and they have a lymphocentigraphy. This is a way for us to map out the lymph nodes. Uh, this was an interesting case, so we, um, I always do it the morning of, we inject technetium and this is the scan and you can, if you have a, a spec CT, you can also do that, which is better at anatomical um, evaluation. Um, this was, a, he, they had a lesion on their back and unfortunately for them, they mapped to all four basins, so bilateral cervical, bilateral axilla. So we don't really know, and this is why we do the test, especially for truncal melanomas, because we don't know which lymph node basins that it would go to. I would never just arbitrarily go on a fishing expedition to find the lymph node if it doesn't map somewhere. Um, so in this patient, we did all four basin sentinel node biopsies. Now, sometimes we see patients that don't map, and if they don't map, I don't go after the lymph node. Then I usually follow them with ultrasound subsequently after the excision, because we, either the lymphatics are disrupted or it didn't spread or whatever it is, but I, don't, I won't go and just do a lymph node biopsy or dissection. So this is a minimally invasive approach, the sentinel lymph node biopsy, all of you have done this. We inject blue dye, lymphazurin, um, uh, or um, there's some other agents you can inject, um, and the technetium and use a Geiger counter. We make a small incision and find the lymph nodes, selectively removing um, lymph nodes that are sent for permanent section for immunohistochemistry and thin cuts. They don't just bread loaf the lymph node. Um, the, uh, in, on average, I take one to four lymph nodes in the axilla. I usually take like one to two in the uh, groin, and it's usually a little more in the head and neck region just because uh, there's more lymph nodes up there. I thought this was an interesting uh, picture. This is a patient who had a subungual melanoma of the finger, and you can, we injected with the blue dye, and you can actually see the lymphatic channels tracking up the hand. So the rationale for doing sentinel node for thin melanomas, uh, this was a large series of 1,100 patients and followed for 11 years. Um, so they found that um, both the Breslow depth and male gender were associated with recurrence. There was about a 4% chance of distant metastasis and a 4% chance of nodal recurrence. Uh, in thin melanomas, the chance, so, so greater than 0.75, there was about a 5 to 12% chance of having lymph node metastasis. And that's why we offer it at that cutoff. That's really the rationale for that number. So Dr. Morton um, designed this trial, multi-selective lymphadenectomy trial number one, or MSLT1. Um, and this was really one of the first trials 
that supported the use of sentinel lymph node biopsy. So pa patients were randomized with excision to excision sentinel node biopsy or wide excision and nodal observation where they didn't do anything. And if you had a positive lymph node, you underwent a complete lymphadenectomy, like we do now. If the node was negative, you had nodal observation. And the patients they observed, if you had a nodal recurrence, then you went on to lymphadenectomy. And if no nodal recurrence, then you observed them. And this was just the breakdown. I don't need to go through that. But there, there was no significant related difference in the 10-year melanoma-specific survival. So there was no real overall survival difference in the sentinel node group. The disease-free survivals, though, were significantly improved in the sentinel node group as compared to observation with intermediate thickness melanomas. If you, the 10-year melanoma-specific survival was 62% if you had a positive node, so if you've identified stage 3 earlier than if you didn't, so if you, it identified patients who had worse disease. And the biopsy-based management improved the 10-year rate of distant disease-free survival and 10-year rates of melanoma-specific survival. And so this really led to the adoption of sentinel node biopsy for the evaluation of patients with melanoma. Um, this... Um, so this is why this slide just speaks to why Clark's really fell out. They did a multivariate analysis of thin melanomas, looking at thickness, mitotic rate, ulceration, and those three things were really the most prognostic um, and informative um, pathologic characteristics. Um, Clark's really kind of fell out in the multivariate analysis on this. So this is the staging system based on thickness, and again, you, uh, you should know this for all your tests, that ulceration is worse. So if you ever see a t question, what's the m worst prognostic variable besides thickness, it's ulceration. And so this is, just shows that the thicker the melanoma here, the worse survival. So these are the, based on the T stage. Um, this is your overall stage, a worse prognosis. And really, once you get into th the thicker 2B and 2C melanomas, these are really concerning melanomas. The more nodes you have, the worse you are, and the stage threes. A 3A may just be a positive sentinel node, and those actually, there are patients that don't behave that poorly if you have just micromet a few cells in the sentinel node. But as you become, stage 3C is surely a very concerning melanoma. You have satellite lesions, you have multiple lymph nodes, and those are very, very concerning melanomas. And the thicker the tumor, the worse the prognosis. This was the multivariate analysis looking at tumor thickness, ulceration, and mitosis. And these, these percentages always strike me. So the 10-year survival for, uh, for thin melanomas, these are early melanomas, the majority of melanomas we see. If it's non-ulcerated with no mitosis, 95% 10-year survival. But if you add in mitosis, that drops down to 88%. And if you add in ulceration with or without mitosis, 85% 10-year survival. This is not an insignificant number for thin melanomas. These are the majority of patients that we're seeing. So stage three melanomas, if you have palpable nodes or a positive sentinel nodes. So it usually at that point is when I stage patients. So I usually get a PET scan. Uh, if they have known stage three disease or if they have a high risk stage two disease, I'll get a CAT scan. Um, we'll get a brain MRI if they have symptoms. I don't generally get it for staging for stage three, but we do for stage four. So Dr. Morton went on and uh, adopted and created uh, a MSLT2, multi-selective lymphadenectomy trial number two. This was an, and all of these trials were amazingly, inner, they were a large volume of patients, 1,900 patients. They were um, international, so working with the Sydney Melanoma Group, uh, European groups to really do high quality uh, surgical trials, and these are some of the best surgical trials that have really been performed uh, internationally. And this was really to determine if you, if you have a positive sentinel node, do you need to go on and do a completion lymphadenectomy, or can you watch these patients? We don't know this information. And so this trial was opened. Um, it randomized patients who had a positive sentinel node to undergo lymphadenectomy or ultrasound surveillance of the lymph affected lymph node basin every four months. And I don't have the results yet. Um, it actually will be come out very, very soon. Um, it's, uh, it will be reported in the New England Journal. Um, and so I would look for it in the next few weeks. Um, but I can't tell you the results. Sorry. So um, just, so the fellow, uh, just going on fellowship training, you know, we do complex general surgical oncology. And so we see residents that come to our fellowship from all different types of programs. And we really just start with the basics. So here's Dr. Tomei learning to cut a banana. 
you know, he's really concentrated on it, and, and so he finally, and then we could get him in the operating room. But yeah. <laughs> so moving on to lymphadenectomy. So um, when we do lymphadenectomy, so I'll speak about axillary and inguinal. So we really try to do, unlike um, breast cancer, where we have a lot of good adjuvant therapies or systemic therapies, we're starting to get that in melanoma, but we uh, really need to do completion lymphadenectomy. So for axilla, we do levels one, two, and three. We uh, try to skeletonize and take all of the vessels. Uh, we consider adjuvant radiation. So historically, radiation was thought to not be that helpful for melanoma, as they were thought to be non-resistant. Actually, melanomas can respond to radiation. We use it selectively in situations, and really it's always a discussion in our tumor boards. Um, so if you have extra capsular extension, we'll consider giving radiation. Um, that's where the melanoma breaks through the capsule of the lymph nodes. Or if there's multiple palpable lymph nodes on presentation, we'll consider this. So this was an interesting case I had. The patient presented with a melanoma and had palpable axillary lymph nodes, and so we resected the melanoma and did an axillary lymphadenectomy. He then presented with this, it's a little hard to see in this picture, but this is a huge recurrence that was in between the lymph node basin, it was basically like an intransient lymph node between the primary and the, where we did the axillary dissection, and this occurred about three years after his presentation. And I don't know how he got, it, it got this big. He's actually a lawyer, he's reasonable. I'm not sure how he didn't notice this. But he came into clinic and said, uh, and he was being followed too by, I, I hadn't seen him for some time, the medical oncologist had seen him, but, and he came in and it was basically a, a mass like this big. And so we staged him with a PET scan and he really, just because of the size of it, he had one, he did have metastatic disease to it, one adrenal gland. And so, but we all decided that because of the size we would take this out and this was the resection, this was the defect. And again, I, my plastic surgeons are amazing, so they closed it primarily. And he has no, right now he's on a PD-1 inhibitor um, with um, really no pet avid lesions systemically, it's amazing. So inguinal lymphadenectomy, I have a specific interest in this because of some tech, new technical um, options for patients. Um, the, historically, we would make an incision here in the groin along the long axis of the limb and remove all the lymph nodes in the femoral triangle. Um, I don't really believe in Cloquet's node. So Cloquet's node, historically, is the node that is um, the highest lymph node in the superficial inguinal triangle. And historically, you would check Cloquet's under frozen section, and theoretically, if that was the positive node, then you would also go and do a deep pelvic lymph node dissection. But the reality is that uh, I think it's, um, it's very unlikely that the all lymphatic drainage goes through one central lymph node before it goes into the deep space. So I don't really think that's an accurate measure. So I choose, in terms of deep pelvic lymphadenectomy, if there's any pet avid lymph nodes, when we stage them, I will offer a uh, deep pelvic lymphadenectomy. If they present with palpable inguinal nodes in the superficial space, I will offer a deep pelvic lymphadenectomy. Um, in, this procedure, there's a 20% chance of having lymph chronic lymphedema after the operation. If you add radiation to it, it's about 40 to 50%. In addition, there's about a 40% chance of, a, of some sort of wound problems or complications when you do it in the open fashion. That being said, it's, like, it's one of my favorite, most beautiful anatomical operations to do open. And then we ruined it. Um, so I was part of a cooperative group uh, through Mayo Clinic um, they started doing, the urologist started doing uh, minimally invasive groin dissection for penile cancer. And uh, this was really spearheaded uh, out of Emory. And then we did, uh, we've published on this a feasibility trial in high volume melanoma centers, including Mayo, Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, Duke, where we all went to Mayo and got trained in doing this minimally invasive groin dissection. And so we, the benefits in my mind of this procedure is that in, if this is the groin crease, so we draw out the femoral triangle, and we're removing the incision down the leg to avoid the complications of wound problems. So we do it through three ports, and what we do is transilluminate, and you can create this flap. And so you create a flap underneath the dermis all the way up, and you can go all the way to the external oblique. And then you can go and you um, take the fascia up the sartorius and adductor muscles, and then you can get underneath and skeletonize the femoral vessels and remove the lymph node packet through these small incisions. 
Um, we leave a drain in place, um, and so these are the three little incisions. This is usually an extraction site. We extract them in a bag or with a wound protector. And this is how they heal. And so it really is a, um, there is no randomized trials that have compared the two techniques, but when we looked at our large series and compared to historical trials, we have found that the rates of lymph node harvest are the same. Um, there is a learning curve. Um, I, subjectively, I've been very satisfied. The patients do quite well. They still get numbness, and I don't think this obviates the risks of lymphedema. You're still disrupting the lymphatic channels. Um, but I think it is a, a new technique. They usually stay one day in the hospital and go home the next day. Uh, I kind of talked about this. Um, sometimes we have to do stranger lymphadenectomies, epitrochlear or popliteal. This was a woman who had popliteal recurrence that we had to do a popliteal lymphadenectomy on. So how do we follow these patients? So um, for clinical stage one, or one to three, I generally see them every six months. Uh, the stage three patients we see every three months uh, with, for, with physical examination. I don't get any imaging on the stage one or two patients unless they're 2B or 2C. And then we will add in uh, a CAT scan. There, they should see their dermatologist usually two to three times a year for full skin examinations. They should learn about identifying moles in themselves and their family members for self-identification. And we discuss sun exposure prophylaxis and the appropriate use of um, of uh, um, sunscreen. For stage 3B and 3C, so there's a 21% chance of recurrence in, in the extremity of in-transit nodules. Um, 2 to 10% of these are, uh, of extremity me melanomas will recur with in-transit disease. And the 5 to 10-year survival, if you have in-transit nodules, is about 25%. So this is a patient who had dermal recurrence in a back melanoma, and you can see all of these uh, nodules are in transit dermal nodules in the back. And um, he was progressing and was really pro-surgery, and, and I resected him, and we did a, they did a, a skin graft, and, um, and it was really, this shows you how limited you are as a surgeon, because very, very quickly afterwards, he had new nodules that were right outside of our area of excision. Uh, these are in-transit nodules of the extremity, and they can be non-pigmented. Um, this was a patient of mine who had a subungual melanoma that presented, and for a while, the, despite having the melanoma and everything, he went. He was down in Florida. He split time between us and Florida, and his dermatologist was treating him. I thought it was psoriasis, just, um, but obviously not. This is another patient with in-transit melanoma. And these are really difficult options to treat. This is really advanced. And so this is really the option. So you can resect. If you see two or three of these, you can resect. But usually it becomes kind of you're chasing the carrot a little bit. So that you, you resect them, and they come back, and then you resect more. Um, so usually I'll do that at maybe one or two. And if they're, if they're all elderly and we pop up with one and then another six months, that is an option. Uh, we can give systemic therapy, and I'll talk about that. There's uh, been tried local injections, so there's BCG, GMCSF, IL-2, Rose Bengal is being trialed in a, a clinical trial. There's vaccines, including a newer uh, medication called uh, TVEC, which is a modified herpes vaccine, which has been approved. There's electroporation. There's a technique where you can give, uh, where you can uh, put these, um, it's like RFA in the skin. You can radiate them. Clinical trials, of course. Amputation for... I would really limit that unless there was really no other options. And then there's uh, regional therapies, hyperthermic, isolated limb perfusion, which is an oxygenated circuit, and isolated limb infusion, which is a non-oxygenated circuit, which I perform. So when we have all these options, it means we really have no idea what's the best option. This is just an example of uh, isolated limb perfusion. You cannulate the vessels in open fashion. You heat the limb. Um, and then you put it, put the limb, a tourniquet above the uh, above the cannulas, and you uh, treat with high dose melphalan and actinomycin D on a bypass circuit. Um, John Thompson at the Sydney Melanoma Unit devised this technique. It's called isolated limb infusion, and so it's a it's a minimally invasive approach uh, to perform the same procedure. We put uh, we cannulate if it's the uh, lower extremities, we, in the contralateral limb, we cannulate the artery and vein in interventional radiology. 
Uh, we then take them to the operating room, they're put to sleep. We then put a tourniquet up, we heparinize them, and so the extremities on a bypass circuit, and we can give much higher doses of melphalan uh, than we could systemically. And we, so we perfuse the limb for 30 minutes, we wash it all out, uh, correct the heparin, and then take the catheters out. So it's a low flow circuit, hypoxic, it's percutaneous, no incisions. Um, and the studies really were just with melphalan and actinomycin D. Um, some have tried some newer agents, although um, there's no good data on, on newer agents. Uh, and really, they tolerate it quite well. They're in the hospital for about seven to 10 days, or sorry, about five to seven days. Um, we watch them overnight. We follow CK levels, because there is a risk of compartment syndrome. There's a very low risk of amputation. Um, sometimes we have to treat with steroids if their levels go too high. And they can have some toxicity, including skin changes, edema, blistering, lymphedema. And this usually peaks at about two to three weeks. And this technique, I know I'm talking about melanoma, we just published a multi-institutional uh, series. You can use this for sarcoma as well, either bridging to surgery or um, for, um, for palliative reasons. Um, Merkel cell, squamous cell, you can consider it for some of these other histologies. And so we put two temperature probes here, you can see, and we heat the limb. You can put uh, either ESMAR uh, or a, a pneumatic uh, tourniquet on. We mark for the uh, radiologist exactly where we want the tips, and we cr calculate limb volumes and dose the melphalan. Um, and basically, you just hand pump the chemotherapy into the extremity. And you can have see some good responses. So th this was a published paper, but you can see it really, you can have dramatic responses in the extremities. And this was a large study from uh, Doug Tyler when he was at Duke um, looking at um, ILIs. And in general, the response rate is about 30% of patients will have a complete response, so that everything goes away. It's generally not durable, so usually they come back. Half of the, a uh, third of the patients will have a partial response, and a third of the patients will have no response. And there's about a 36% chance of having, there's this vibrating toxicity, which has to do with the blistering and, and, and limbs. And so this was the response, but as you can see, the, uh, the complete response is not really durable. And this is just an algorithm that was published on how to manage in transit disease. If you need to do a pelvic lymphadenectomy, you can do lymphadenectomies with ILI, superficial or deep, but if you're gonna do a deep pelvic lymph node dissection, you're already there with the vessels, you can just cannulate the vessels and probably should consider going to a center that offers limb perfusion. Um, so I believe in work-life balance. This is, balance. This is when Dr. Tomei went to the Van Halen concert with our thoracic surgeons at Fox Chase. So moving on briefly to systemic therapy. So really there has been an explosion of options for patients of, with melanoma in the past five to 10 years. Um, prior to this, if you had metastatic melanoma, it generally was you could get some chemotherapy that didn't really work that well, that had a moderate toxicity, and then you would die from the melanoma. And that's changed. And really, uh, the treatment for melanoma has really changed the paradigm for um, all types of cancers and clinical trials that we're treating with right now. So there's targeted agents. We can do molecular profiling on melanoma. And if you have a BRAF or MEC or KIT mutation, which are the most common, or NRAS, you can treat with targeted therapy, like BRAF inhibitors or MEC inhibitors. Uh, there's uh, immunotherapy, so ipilimumab was approved. Um, now going on three or four years ago. Uh, and then PD-1 inhibitors uh, came onto the scene. Um, and then combination therapy. So all of these options for patients with melanoma. So right now we have more clinical trials open for melanoma patients at our center uh, than as many clinical trials than any of the other histologies. Uh, and so it's really exciting time. We try to put everyone we can on clinical trials now. And it's usually treating with the best known agent like a PD-1 inhibitor with something, a combination, PD-1 with something else, IDO inhibitor, um, MEC inhibitor, uh, TVEC, things like that. So BRAF mutations are seen in about 50% of patients with melanoma. Um, it, it is thought that maybe if you have a BRAF and NRAS mutation, you may have a worse prognosis. Younger patients are more likely to be BRAF positive. And the response rates approach, approach 70% if you have a BRAF mutation and are treated with BRAF inhibitors or combination. Usually we don't do single agent now. We use BRAF and MEK inhibitors. 
Um, they work really, really well, really, really quickly, but they don't work. At about six to 10 months, they start to have resistance and you'll see regrowth. But if you have someone who is rapidly progressing, who is BRAF mutated, uh, this surely is a good option for patients to have a dramatic, quick response. So we've been looking at, we have a 50 gene panel that we have at, uh, for patients, uh, advanced patients with melanoma that we use at Fox Chase. It's an in-house panel. And this was just a breakdown of our uh, overall and recurrent patients. So the majority of patients uh, had a BRAF or NRAS mutation. There was an increased uh, NRAS mutation um, in patients who had a recurrence. And then we also identified P53 and CDK N2A mutations. And then looking at the number of mutations, uh, in general, patients would have, uh, one, most commonly have one mutation, but sometimes we see more than four mutations in patients with melanoma. And these are all things that we really are figuring out. We don't know that, we don't know if these mutations or different mutations predict response to system and immunotherapy, and really it's an active area of uh, investigation and research. So this is the immune checkpoint inhibitors. So this is where anti-CTLA-4 or ipilimumab works, and the anti-PD-1 inhibitors, and the volumab or pembrolizumab work. Um, and this was the first study. This was a very exciting study because before IPI was approved, there was no agent that showed an overall survival benefit in patients with melanoma. Uh, for years and years, anything we did did not show an overall survival benefit. And so when this um, was published in the New England Journal in 2011, this showed that when they compared it to decarbazine plus placebo, which was the standard chemotherapy, when you gave IPI, uh, the median overall all survival increased from nine months to 11 months, which doesn't sound that dramatic for surgeons, but for medical oncologists, it was earth shattering. And th then things improved quite quickly. So then they looked at, um, the, so that survival in the second line setting, so if patients had already been treated and then got IPI, they had a better overall survival. If you gave the long-term survival, so there was patients that were living for months and months and months where historically the patients would die here and then we were seeing patients who survived out to 60 months on IPI where if you had a dramatic response, this was, this was uh, it, it continued, which was just amazing. Um, so, and these drugs um, can cause problems, but it's not like the standard chemotherapy problems that you see. They really have itises. So they can present with hepatitis, thyroiditis, colitis, dermatitis, hypophysitis, pruritus, and we see this. And it's really important as surgeons, we actually just had a committee meeting, to know that if patients are on this, if you're getting a consult in the emergency room, um, that we've had patients who were treated for ARDS with pneumonitis from... Uh, immunotherapy that really just needed steroids and ended up dying because um, they weren't treated appropriately because they'd be working up for a pneumonia and then ARDS. And so if, if any of the patients are on these immunotherapy, you have to be really be, as a surgeon, have a knowledge at least that what they're on because a lot of times the colitis can be very significant and generally everything is reversible with steroids. And so their medical oncologists need to be notified and a lot of ER physicians don't know this. And so it is an area of we're working on ways to improve communication and, uh, for these patients. So the PD-1 inhibitors, this was nivolumab, showed an even better survival benefit. Uh, and this was comparing to, to carbazine when compared to um, uh, ipilimumab with even less side effects um, than patients. And so we have patients who are 90 years old on these drugs who actually are doing quite well. Now, the longer you're on them, the more problems we do see, including I have patients who are 40 or have really, really significant arthritis because there's so many questions that we, we have to answer right now that we don't know the answer. Like, so if you respond to this, how long do you treat? And right now, we're just treating, but we don't know the answer. And then this was looking at IPI versus Pembro, and Pembro really has become the standard of care, first line agent for melanoma, the PD-1 inhibitors, either Pembro or Nevo, because of its um, significant uh, benefit in survival. And this was the most recent um, uh, study really looking at combination therapy. So if you combined a PD-1 inhibitor and anti-CTLA-4 antibody versus the CTLA-4 alone, really there is a um, survival benefit with combination therapy. That being said, anytime you combine something, the toxicity is worse. So I think in younger patients, this would be first-line therapy uh, outside of a clinical trial. And this was just the, I think we had progression-free survival and overall survival. 
So briefly, I'll go through this and then uh, we'll be done. So this was just an example of a patient that I saw, a 73-year-old who had a right posterior shoulder melanoma. No skin cancer, no significant, significant sun exposure with blistering sunburns, kind of like the patient that like never really goes to the doctor and his wife told him to come in. So we went to the NCCN guidelines. It was superficial spreading melanoma. There's multiple different subtypes. It was three millimeters, ulcerated, mitosis of three. Um, clinical stage 2B melanoma based on the uh, biopsy. And so we resected it. We considered sentinel node biopsy because of the thickness. And so we resected it with two centimeter margins and did a sentinel node biopsy. So there was no remaining melanoma in the specimen. Our margins were negative. He had one sentinel node that was positive for melanoma. It was a microscopic foci, um, no extranodal extension. So his ultimate pathologic stage was a stage 3B melanoma because of the lymph node. So because of that, we staged him and we got an MRI of the brain at the time. We got a PET CT scan. There was no evidence of metastatic disease. He was referred to medical oncology, discussed in our tumor board. We sent molecular profiling on him and he, had, he was NRAS mutated. He did not have a BRAF or a KIP mutation. And patients who do have a KIP mutation, like patients with GIS, we can actually consider treating with imatinib or Gleevec. Um, and there is a response known in patients with melanoma. So uh, at this point, we considered completion lymphadenectomy versus adjuvant therapy, or, or these were the two really pathways we had to make a decision on. And this is the NCCN guidelines related to that. So he opted for close surveillance and no adjuvant therapy. Um, we have uh, older patients frequently will make this choice. Um, they are adjuvant therapy for melanoma right now. There's, you can give ipilimumab, you can give interferon, uh, high dose interferon, um, which isn't, it's not, both of which are not that enticing to patients. Um, and interesting enough, the ipilimumab is, the, it was trial, the trial looked at two doses. And the higher dose is the one that's approved right now uh, that showed a survival benefit in, in stage three patients, but there is a higher toxicity. Um, and so there are adjuvant trial, also clinical trials now for the PD-1 inhibitors. So he was seen every three months with imaging and then he presented with this. So he had a recurrence in the shoulder and a supraclavicular lymph node here you can see. So this looked like an in-transit and nodal recurrence. And the question was, was it resectable? Um, I actually took him to surgery. He was very pro-surgery and not pro-systemic um, therapy. And when I went in to try to excise the one nodule on the shoulder, as I made my incision, I saw that the dermis was peppered with little black nodules. And so I excised the one nodule, but I didn't do the lymph node knowing that he had a significant amount of disease there that we just weren't seeing. So he was started on ipilimumab. He had significant side effects, including hypopituitarism, hypophysitis, severe hyponatremia, syncope, colitis requiring hospitalization and high-dose steroids. Um, and initially responded, but then progressed, and you can see here. He was again discussed in our multi-tumor board. At this point, we considered radiation. So there is something called an abscopal effect with the idea that um, radiation breaks the melanoma cells, increasing antigen presentation. Um, and there may be some benefit to that. And be, for local control, we gave him radiation. And really, that made this less pet avid here and this less pet avid. And you can see here, it was interesting. So this was his initial scar. And you can see underneath the skin here were all these black nodules. And as we treated him, it really was stable. And we were unclear if this was just treated melanoma or, or persistent disease. He initially progressed. And then we treated him with PD-1 inhibitors. Um, and then he progressed on this uh, later. But this is someone who likely would have passed away, and he was alive for three, three plus years after his initial surgery uh, using this strategy. And we're seeing patients who are on longer and longer and longer. Um, and you can see he progressed here in the lung and in the lymph node. So th we are seeing things now. Um, it's, um, it's hard to sometimes understand if you're not seeing it, but things that were unthinkable uh, it really is an amazing, exciting time. Um, so this is a woman who presented with a melanoma on her leg and on an initial s staging, and I just took two selective images. She had huge bulky lymph nodes in the chest. She had sub-Q metastasis. Her lungs were peppered with melanoma, you can see here. And she was treated with a PD-1 inhibitor for a year and a half. 
and had nothing. We, we could not identify, the only thing that she had was a groin lymph node that had some pet avidity. And, I, and she was younger and we pushed the limit and I actually did a groin dissection on her and we removed this lar larger lymph node about this size um, and everything was dead uh, under the microscope. There was no, re no remaining melanoma in the specimen. So these are, these are responses that for any type of cancer, the medical oncologist would just really, they're striving for. And these are responses that we're seeing not only in melanoma, but if you, any um, histology is being, tr cl clinical trials are with immunotherapy are being used in colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, GU cancers, um, and really this is the future. This is what we're aiming for. And I think as a surgeon, we're gonna have to change our paradigm and think, because once we figure out the immune system, because right now it doesn't really, unless like for colon cancer, the Im immunotherapy doesn't really work for colon cancer unless you have uh, MSI uh, instability. And that's the clinical trials and indication. But if we can figure out the immune system in ways to activate the immune system to recognize tumors, uh, this is gonna change our landscape for everything that we do where we're gonna be confronted with patients now that have a recurrence four years out from pancreatic cancer in the liver and how do we manage that? So I think in the future we're gonna be doing a lot more metastasectomies and dealing with patients now that have either one isolated spot that is progressing um, where everything else is not and we're gonna to have to work as a team to come up with the best kind of targeted, personalized therapy for these types of patients because we don't know how long to treat with these agents. We don't know what to do with these situations. Do we just follow them? Do we operate? It's really just uncharted territory but it's also very exciting. This was just her PET scan. You can see all the lesions in her upper abdomen and chest and then, and this was in her groin and they all went away. So um, as a surgeon, I ne no one ever told me about this when I was training, so I get, um, I really build special relationships with my patients. Uh, this is a woman who had a, uh, on the top left, a foot melanoma and, and her shirt says, kicking cancer's ass one foot at a time. Um, we are, uh, I'm very involved in advocacy groups and um, we do this race every year called Miles for Melanoma in Philadelphia where we fox chase the skin cancer screening. And this is, uh, this is Dr. Tomei's uh, boyfriend, Dr. Uh, Reddy. They were fellows together. Um, but these are, this is my PA, these are two of our fellows. This is, um, these are two of my patients. And so it really is important to, to get involved in these types of things in any type of, whatever type of surgeon you are. I think it really builds relationships with your patients and their families and your team. Um, so there's nothing greater, uh, there's nothing greater as a educator to be so proud of your trainees and when you see their successes. I think part of what I do is educate medical students and residents and fellows and um, really to see them progress in their career is really uh, one of the best things that you do when you're an academic surgeon. Uh, this was uh, at uh, SSO a couple years ago. And so thank you, these are my three children. Um, if you have any questions, you can email me. Or I appreciate uh, the honor to give this uh, talk, thank you. So we surely are looking at molecular profiling for these subtypes of melanoma because I totally agree they're different, they're different entities. I think we will be, the, um, there's different mutations and options for these patients. Um, the acral lentiginous, even if they're not as advanced from a stage standpoint, are worse players. And we will have a higher index to evaluate them with staging studies that I wouldn't normally do even if it's not stage three because of the risk. And I will follow them closer with staging. We generally still would treat them either on clinical, you know, the clinical trials for acral lentiginous will still include, uh, you can treat them with immunotherapy, but I don't have an answer if they behave worse or better with immunotherapy. Similarly for um, mucosal melanomas, vulvo, vulvo, vaginal, anal, 
uh, nasal, all of those, we have seen responses with immunotherapy, so we will consider treatment with them. Um, but there are some targeted therapies that also work for those that we will um, have initiated based on the molecular profile. That makes sense. No, so generally our insurance for stage three and stage four should cover, surely for stage four. Um, and, um, you know, there are companies that you can send out to that are larger gene panels that really should be covered. So there's... Uh, not, not necessarily for like URAP, but um, we're talking like for some of the genetic... Stuff well, a lot, of a lot of times they will cover these larger gene panels. And st they won't do... If you've already sent BRAF, you may not be able to do it. Do it. But if you do it initially, uh, yeah, the larger panels, the 250 to 400 gene panels, uh, which cover all of that, generally we do get covered. So you just have to talk to your kind of financial and or their insurance companies to see beforehand. But. Any other questions? Sorry, I had a